This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, everyone. Good morning and welcome to the Presbyterian Church of Mount Kisco. Thank you for joining us today for worship in person and online. Thanks to Eric Kramer for a rousing beginning to our worship service. Pastor Dale and Elizabeth are away this morning. As you know, they are leading our mission, our youth mission trip to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. On Friday night, Dale reported that the high school service project spent the 4th of July at the birthplace of America. He says, we were at Independence Hall in the early evening on July 4th to hear a tour of the historic center called The Black Journey, African American Walking Tour of Philadelphia. Our theme for the week is Micah chapter 6, verse 8, to do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with God. During their visit, they learned of the injustice done to black Americans since slavery and the kindness shown by many on the Underground Railroad. On Friday morning, they did their first volunteer stint at MANA, M-A-N-N-A, -N -N -A, MANA, a program that provides healthy meals to thousands of critically ill residents of Philly and the surrounding area. On Friday afternoon, they continu continued the learning with a tour of Philadelphia's unique neighborhood. In 90 degree heat, they took a tour of the history of the struggle of LGBTQIA equality in the city of brotherly love. Dale reported this morning that they're off to good start later on Saturday. They worked at a place called the St. Francis Inn, where they served over 100 meals, cafe style, to a hot, tired group of folks living on the streets. The neighborhood has a high drug abuse and homeless rate, along with many low-income seniors and families with small children who came for a free meal on a hot day. He says he would be proud of our youth, they were the leader, as were the leaders of San Francis. They will have a time of worship today before heading home in the middle of all this traffic. Let's keep in our, in our prayers. We expect that the youth group with Dale and Elizabeth will report in a more co complete way next Sunday during worship. We will not be having Sunday school today. There are activity kits in the narthex for our children. Uh, we do have a children's message prepared if there are children among us. Let's prepare our hearts and minds uh, to worship God. Please rise if you're able when you hear the church bells for the call to worship. Please rise. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. We ponder your steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Let us worship God. When bad things happen to us in life, they cause us to doubt God's love. But God shows his love for us, for when we were sinners, Christ died for us. Let us confess our sins this morning and receive new life. Please join me in the reading of the unison prayer of confession. Holy God, we confess that we have not lived for your glory. You sent us prophets to teach us, but we have not listened to them. You sent us your son to save us, but we ignore your living word. Forgive us, God of grace, by your power at work within us. Remove our faithlessness and restore our faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Let us now share our private prayers and confessions with God in a moment of silence. Jesus Christ, born of Mary, Son of God, was broken and poured out for our salvation. Friends, believe the good news, 
In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you. At this time, please let us pray. Dear God, knowing that you hear our prayers and trusting in the Spirit to intercede with sighs too deep for words, let us pray together this morning saying, merciful God, hear our prayers. War and death are all around us today. The world groans with the weight of conflicts in Gaza and the Ukraine and elsewhere. We ask for peace in our violent world. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Our leaders need wisdom. The issues before us now are controversial and affect everyone. Help our leaders to act faithfully and to promote the common good. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Many of our people are hungry and can find no rest. We pray for those who lack employment or shelter or food. We pray for our high school mission team today in Philadelphia. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Some of us are sick today and some of us are dying. We ask for healing and health. We ask that you be present in life and death. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Our hearts are troubled because our country is divided. Guide us until we find our rest in you. Hear the secret prayers that each one of us offers to you and you alone. Merciful God, hear our prayers. We give you thanks, O oh God, for you are faithful and your love never ends. With the help of the Spirit, we pray to you, confident that all things work together for good for those who love you and are called to according to your purpose. We pray especially for Rose, brother and son-in-law today. Merciful God, hear our prayers. Amen. morning. The first reading this morning is Psalm 48, which is about the glory and strength of Zion. A song, a psalm of the Korahites. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised in the city of our God. His holy mountain, beautiful in elevation, is the joy of all the earth, Mount Zion in the far north the city of the great king. Within its citadels, God has shown himself a sure defense. Then the kings assembled, they came on together. As soon as they saw it, they were astounded. They were in panic, they took to flight. Trembling took hold of them there, pains as of a woman in labor, as when an east wind shatters the ships of Tarshish. As we have heard, so have we seen in the city of the Lord of hosts, in the city of our God, which God establishes forever. We ponder your stead steadfast love, O God, in the midst of your temple. Your name, O God, is like your praise, reaches to the ends of the earth. Your right hand is filled with victory. 
Let Mount Zion be glad. Let the towns of Judah rejoice because of your judgments. Walk about Zion. Go all around it. Count its towers. Consider well its ramparts. Go through its citadels that you may tell the next generation that this is God, our God forever and ever. He will be our guide forever. This is the word of the Lord. The second scripture reading this morning is taken from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, verses 1 through 13. The rejection of Jesus at Nazareth. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? Where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, Prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. Then he went out among the villages teaching. He called the 12 disciples and began to send them out two by two and gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. He said to them, Wherever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the place. If any place will not welcome you and they refuse to hear you as you leave, shake off the dust that is on your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy God, your word has the power to restore our lives. Open our hearts to the presence of your spirit so we may overcome our failures and entrust our lives to you. Amen. The Prime Minister of Great Britain during World War II was Winston Churchill. Churchill was one of the greatest leaders his country has ever known. He led the fight against Hitler and was an inspiring public speaker. If it wasn't for Churchill, we'd all be speaking German today. Churchill called a general election when the war was over after six years in office. His opponent promised to help the British people uh, to uh, after the war by introducing the modern welfare state. Churchill was defeated in a landslide. He will be remembered for a long time in the history books, but Churchill was rejected by his own people at his moment of triumph. The same thing happens to Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. At the beginning of his ministry, Jesus performs several miracles that astonish the people of Israel. Along with the mir miracles, Jesus proclaims the good news in sermons and parables. His teachings astound the people and strike a nerve. Then Jesus returns to his hometown to preach in the local synagogue for the first time. Why do his family and friends take offense and reject him completely? It's hard to know for sure. 
Preaching in the town where you grow up has never been an easy thing to do. When you stand up there in the pulpit for the first time with your old girlfriends and high school teammates and former teachers sitting there in the pews, it's hard to establish your authority as a preacher. The audience knows you so well growing up that they're unable to take you seriously as a spiritual leader. It's possible that Jesus' friends rejected him because they resented his accomplishments. Anthony Robinson is a pastor who wrote an article about President Obama when Obama was first elected president. Robinson had received a letter from a reader who went to high school with Obama and expressed resentment about Obama's rise. The high school friend knew President Obama as somebody who used to stand under the bleachers and smoke. Now he was president. The friend's reaction was, who does Obama think he is anyway? Why him and not me? Jesus was probably rejected because he claimed to be a prophet and the messenger of God. That was just too much for a small town to absorb. Historians believe that the town of Nazareth had about 300 people. In the Bible passage, Jesus is described as the son of Mary. His father, Joseph, is not mentioned. Nazareth may have considered Jesus to be illegitimate. This is also the place in the Bible where we learn that Jesus worked with his hands. The Greek word for Jesus' occupation is tekton, which means carpenter or perhaps stonemason. Jesus was a construction worker from an ordinary family who at the age of 30 started to talk and act as if he were the son of God. Jesus had no formal training as a religious rabbi. It was a shock for the people of Nazareth to learn that the person they knew as Jesus now claimed to be somebody completely different. The reaction of the people in Nazareth is the story of Jesus' life on earth. The good news in ancient Israel is heard against a dark background of rejection and disbelief. The Gospel of John says in chapter 1, Jesus came to his own home and his own people received him not. Earlier in Mark, after Jesus performs his first miracle, his mother and siblings attempt to rescue him and take him home in the mistaken belief that he's crazy. The identity of Jesus is not just questioned by strangers, but by family members who knew him well. The mistake that Jesus' family and friends make is one that you and I also make in our relationship with God. The people of Nazareth can't believe that God is at work in everyday life. They are unable to see God in the people they know or the world that they live in. In the Bible, God is not just found in major events like the exodus from Egypt. God is also found in the lives of ordinary people who are insignificant except in the eyes of God. God enters the world in the person of Jesus, an ordinary Jew from a third world country to emphasize that God is not distant and removed, but near us and with us. In this church, we share a belief that God is the creator of the world and the center of the universe. But the idea that God is present today in ordinary things and ordinary people, that is somewhat harder for us to believe. The truth is that God can affect our lives in all sorts of ways. God can speak to us today through family members, including spouses and parents. God can show up when we encounter strangers on a trip. God can confront us when our opponents make a good point at our expense. Many, many people think that God speaks to us in the faces of children who are poor 
and hungry. The reason we are in church today is because we all believe at some level that God speaks to us through the reading of the Bible, through sacraments like the Lord's Supper, through Sunday school and rummage sales and mission trips. When you have the eyes and ears of faith, you can experience God every Sunday in this church and others like it. Just for a moment, though, think about what happens when we are unable to believe in a world where God exists and is a part of our daily lives. The real tragedy is that when we lack faith, we don't ask God for help and fewer miracles happen. In the Bible lesson, Jesus' ability to perform deeds of power is affected by his hometown's lack of faith. Without faith, the amount of healing that Jesus accomplishes is reduced. In Nazareth, it's all he can do to heal a few sick people. Mark is not saying that Jesus becomes powerless because the people of Nazareth lack faith. In the Gospel of Mark, Jesus performs many miracles without any reference to the faith of those who benefit. But a negative response to Jesus can have a dampening, restrictive effect. If we believe, God will probably do more. That is why the spiritual climate of this church, its openness to the Spirit, can matter. If we are receptive to the work of God, if we have faith, we are more likely to experience the activity of God and notice it in other people. Tom Friedman writes a column about foreign policy in the New York Times. He once told a story about why the Middle East peace process always seems to break down. A man named Goldberg wants to win the lottery. Every week when the results are announced, Goldberg prays to God, God, why don't I ever win the lottery? What have I done wrong? I'm a good man. Why shouldn't I win? The next week, Goldberg is disappointed again and cries out, What will it take, Lord? Would it be so hard for you just once to let me win the lottery? The clouds part, the heavens open, and a voice from heaven is finally heard. Goldberg, God says, give me a chance. Buy a lottery ticket. <laughs> if you want to win the lottery, you have to buy a ticket. If you want peace in the Middle East, you have to negotiate. If we want God's help in our day-to-day -day lives, it helps to have faith. The rejection that Jesus experiences in the local synagogue is a turning point in his life and ministry. The bad news is that Jesus accepts the negative verdict of his hometown and leaves. The good news is that he doesn't argue or dispute with the people who reject him. Jesus does not waste valuable time or energy. He cuts his losses and he moves on. Do you handle rejection well? For most of us, rejection is demoralizing and lonely. But not everyone reacts that way. The manager of the Liverpool, Liverpool Football Club in England, is, in England recently announced his retirement after seven years of unparalleled football success. Jurgen Klopp, a German national, won so many trophies for Liverpool that they called him the fifth beetle. Klopp was the typical alpha male expression of athletic success. He had physical presence. He had personal charisma. He pumped his fist when a goal was scored. He bear hugged everyone on the team when the contest was over and won. But Jurgen Klopp also had an interesting perspective on failure. Before a recent championship game with Barcelona. He told his players, 
If we can win, wonderful. If not, then fail in the most beautiful way. Telling people that defeat is acceptable can empower them to take risks, making success more likely in the future. When you think about it, faith, failure is not shameful in the world of sports, it's inevitable. When you learn how to lose a big game and keep going, that is a lesson of, about resilience that will help you throughout life. That is what Jesus teaches his disciples to, to handle, how to handle rejection in the Bible. When he sends his disciples out to engage in ministry for the first time on their own, his advice is, don't worry about failure. Travel light and trust in God. The disciples are instructed to travel light because their mission is urgent. They are invited to live a simple lifestyle not out of necessity, but as a sign of reliance on God rather than their own abilities. When they run into resistance, the disciples are not to force themselves on anyone or assume responsibility for their own decisions. They are to shake the dust from their feet and try someplace else. The disciples are able to function effectively and handle rejection because their only resource is Jesus himself. What we need to remember as disciples today is that the mission we have been given is God's mission rather than our own. We are serving God's mission, but not fighting his battles for him. Jesus sends, him, sends us, we go, and good things result. Once upon a time, there was a prominent church that was known for decades for great preachers and as a center of great social causes. The church went through a period of serious decline and for a while there was a thought that the church might fail. A new minister arrived and promoted a renewal in the congregation by summarizing her understanding of the Bible in just six words. Her summary of the Bible was, I am God and you are not. It is not about you and it is not about me. It is about God. If we want to be good Christians, if we want the strength to handle the kind of rejection that Jesus himself faced, we need to forget about our own limitations and go, call on God to lead us now and in the future. The people that Jesus sent out two by two were like the people who rejected him at Nazareth. The difference was that the faith of the first disciples made them resilient. Mark writes, they went out and proclaimed that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and cured them. Let's pray. Almighty God, you thank, we thank you for the example of Jesus who experienced rejection but continued to trust in you. Amen. Jesus said to Peter, those to whom much is given of them, much will be required. Let us bear witness to the love of God by presenting our gifts of thanksgiving. Let us now bring forward our tithes and offerings. Thank you for joining us for worship this morning. Happy birthday to the United States of America. Please join us for coffee and good things in Fellowship Hall hosted by the Tabrock family. And now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
and the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.